I take things very seriously when it impacts me and I just want the very best of things to work and it drives me insane if I can't solve a problem. It's the same for clients. I will go to the nth degree to find a solution to something, providing it doesn't break any laws. But I will do anything possible to get the outcome for my client. Hello there and welcome to the My Future Business Show. This is the show that gets you in front of your best audience and keeps you there. My name is Rick Nusky. It is great to have you here and this is your first time. If that is the case, welcome to the show. I know you're in for a treat today because on today's show, I have the pleasure of welcoming multi-award winning growth coach, marketing, advertising and public relations uh, leader and founder of Access Global and the Sweet Release Agency, Braden Reese. Welcome to the show, Braden. Hey, Rick, thanks for having me, and hello, listeners and watchers, if you're checking out this uh, podcast or videocast today. Absolutely. Yes, a pleasure to have you here. Now, you and I were going to be talking about living authentically, the process behind building your own brand, the entrepreneur's journey, and what it takes to achieve success through adversity. So it's certainly a lot to unpack here. It's quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain we're going to have a great time on this call today, Braden. But uh, first and foremost, where are you calling from today? I'm calling from the Southern Highlands of New South Wales. So it's, a, like, it's about an hour or so out of Sydney. People think it's a lot further than it is. It's the same distance as Borkloos across the Harbour Bridge to the CBD yep. um, as it is from the CBD to where I am. But it's more country. It's very much wine area, weddings. It's that sort of capital very nice. of, of Sydney. Well, it's very country, very hot at the moment. Lots of kangaroos. <laughs> yeah, lots of kangaroos, lots of wildlife. That's for sure. Now, tell me yeah. a little bit. Um, was that where you grew? Where you grew up? And uh, let's let's talk about no, where you grew no, up. No. Um, I. It's funny, kind of weird. I didn't even know the Southern Highlands existed. Um, I I grew up in Campbelltown, which isn't far from where I am now. Um, so Campbelltown, MacArthur, southwestern suburbs of Sydney, uh, and grew up in Campbelltown, only child, that sort of rouge. Yes. But I thought that where the train line stops, that was it. I knew Camden and Picton were <laughs> around the same area, and I went to school in Menangle Park, uh, but I didn't actually know that beyond that was where I am now. So I lived in Campbelltown, grew up in Campbelltown, my family were in Campbelltown, they now live in Brisbane. Um, and I ended up moving to Melbourne for a little while or a couple of years and then met my other half and now I'm in the Highlands. Fantastic. But, uh, yeah, I now know that the Highlands exist. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is a world beyond the world, as, as they say. Now, I know, yeah, exactly. that, I know that your parents have a, a lot to do with your life and they've, they've played a big part and there's some things I'd love to talk about in a moment in that respect. But totally. Tell, tell us a little bit about the things you like doing when you're not running your businesses. How do you, how do you spend um, your downtime? Look, my downtime is reading. At the moment, I'm studying law. I'm one of those su uh, suckers, or what are they called, glutton for punishment? Oh, yes. Um, I am one of those over-educators. I just, I love learning and I love reading. And yep. I, it's, it's kind of a downfall a little bit, but also a positive because I have done so much study. I'm now studying, like I'm doing my law degree now. Yep. And that's what I'm doing in my downtime. So when I'm not running my business, I'm brushing up on these extra skills to be a <laughs> <laughs> to be a lawyer. So it's do, kind of like, it's not really downtime. I'm still working when I'm not working. Do you, um, do you give yourself any time to have a down few moments? Yeah, downtime? well, I guess the good thing is, is that I don't work five days a week. Um, I used to when I first started, but I've managed to work my time out. So I'm really only doing three days a week, um, one day of study. And then I do get my long weekend, as I like to call it, where I get the weekend plus the Monday off. Beautiful. which is in sync with my other half because he doesn't work weekends uh, weekends or Mondays either. So Beautiful. we get to spend that time together. So that's really good. Um, but, you know, that's where I go to a cocktail bar, have a few drinks, see some live music, go into the city, watch a theatre show, things that I'm passionate about anyway, but does take my mind off the law course um, and <laughs> running a business. So, Tell me, where are you at with your, yeah. with your studies? First year, second year, third year, where are you? On a technicality scale, I'd say I'm halfway through. I've managed to fast track it to be a two-year completion. Oh, yeah. Um, most people take about five to six years to complete their degree. I was enrolled with another provider that was doing what they call a diplomas of law mm -hmm. um, without being too aggressive with my opinion on that course, <laughs> I made I made the decision that it was not a fit for me and I would rather do it faster 
then subject myself to the way in which that program was being delivered. I, I know everyone has different learning styles. As a coach, I know my clients respond and react differently to things. And I'm also one of those learners that's very kinesthetic. I like to get my hands on it and oh, know yeah. that I... Um, and the, the Diploma of Law program, unfortunately, is made, made for auditory and visual learners. I like to get my hands dirty. And if yep. I can't do it, then I'm not going to remember it. So I decided to get out of that, go to a degree. Yep. Um, and now I'm comfortably enrolled currently at the point of this podcast taking place with Charles Sturt University doing my two-year law degree instead of, um, oh, you know, is. instead of five or even six because if yeah. you stuff up a subject at another six months. So at least I've got the flexibility now that if I need another year because I'm not that great at one thing <laughs> or if I need time off, I've actually bought myself three years of grace time just in case I need that extra year. But I have enrolled at a full-time level of doing 12 subjects a year to smash out the course in two years. Dusted. Get it done. I start, I've like, so I have started and done some subjects already in commercial and criminal contracts and general areas of law with the diplomas of law, and I've transferred that to the course I'm in now. Yep. Um, so I'm kind of at the start, but not really, because yep. I've already done some stuff and now I can do it a lot faster. So well, thank I you. like yeah. to say I'm halfway through, because <laughs> it techni technically is. Yeah, well, look, um, you're certainly <laughs> having to work hard for it. There's no shortage of commitment and dedication. You can see by that, see that by the fact that you're running uh, the businesses that you are. But let's go back a little bit. What was um, yeah. growing up for you like? Tell us a little bit about a memory that you might recall, a positive one. <laughs> plenty, plenty of positive ones. I've got, a really, I've got a really good family. My parents are lovely. Um, I kind of took that for granted. They were always there. They always listened. I'm an only child, so yep. I, I guess it's kind of um, another. What's what I'm looking for? You know, kind of another blessing in itself is that yep. I did. I am an only child. I don't have to compete for attention, uh, which is great. So, but my parents were always there. One memory I have. That's not so much when I was a child, but one that I remember very... Actually, no, one when I was a child is my parents are very eclectic with their theatre and art stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was always encouraged to be myself and, um, you know, live my best life and be creative. There was never any, um, you know, restrictions on what I can and can't do with what I want to do and who I wanted to be. Yep. So having that growing up was really good. Um, then as I got older and came out, yep. they were also there with that, and they've come along for the ride in every aspect of who I've become. So, and I, I, I'm very grateful of that, and a fond memory it was when I did Australia's Got Talent um, as my drag queen alter ego charismatic. I was going to ask you um, about this. Uh, where they came with me and we, they were on the show. And if you look me up online, you'll see our video that made I it on the, on the telly. So, um, <laughs> you know, that's a really big highlight moment was that they were there yep. um, and they were part of that experience and they are genuinely involved and passionate about anything I do that makes me happy and showcases my talents because that's all they ever wanted for me was to be happy. So well, um, look, I can tell great you, family. <laughs> you have a wonderful family base and I think it spells out a lot about the importance of having people around you that support you. Now, tell me something, Braden. Mm. When did you realise you had such a wonderful voice? In the shower. No. Um, <laughs> look, I, I started with a clarinet. My first instrument was a clarinet, um, and that's what I was doing with high school. So I was I carried it through primary school, actually. I picked up, decided I'd go to this music thing, um, and this lady came to the school with a bunch of instruments and said, which one do you want to try? And I'm like, oh, I like that one. And it came in a little black try box. It. And took it home, and Mum's like, "What the fuck did you just bring home?" And I'm like, "Oh, I can play it." And I played like Hot Cross Buns or Three Blind Mice, and I thought I was amazing. So my first instrument was a clarinet, um, but then because I'm not really good at writing music or creating, any, I can read it and play it, but I was never any good at writing it um, yep. myself. I just decided, you know what, I could do other things. And then I got to my HSC in, in high school for music and I had a choice of, because my instrument was the clarinet at that point still, that I'd have to read music, do a sort of exam on scales and arpeggios. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Uh. I, can play, I can play the instrument, but don't ask me to do this shit. <laughs> Extra stuff. 
I'm yeah. like, yeah, don't, don't ask me, oh, can you play an arpeggio scale? Play the key of C. I'll be like, what's that? Yeah, can I can explain? read it. <laughs> I cannot. I can read it, but I don't understand the language. So my brain doesn't seem to work that way musically. No, no. So I decided to wing it um, and sing. Because I knew I could hold a tune because I've been sitting in bands and I could hum the notes that I needed to play and I could hear it where I would need to come in and I'd just sit there and hum along with the, with the bands that I was in. So I thought, well, maybe I can actually put words to that and started trying to hum a tune. And the first thing I sang was Everything by Michael Bublé. Mm -hmm. um, and I took that into the music classroom and the teacher's like, what are you doing for your exam? And I said, well, I'm going to sing. And he's like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. He's like, we've never heard you sing. You know, this is graded. Yeah, and like, great. I can't. I can't change the grade if you're shit. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I know that, Mr. Stimson. Thank you very much for your honesty. Um, he's one of the teachers I remember fondly through my career who said throughout it with the music stuff. Yep. To just, he goes, you know, you just need to be honest to yourself as a musician and just go for it. Um, and and so that's and I did, and I did the song, and his, his mouth hit the ground, and the whole classroom was like, holy shit, he can sing. He can sing. Um, and I'm like, oh, okay, shit, I can. Because I just thought, oh, yeah, I can sing enough to pass this assessment task. But I didn't think that I'd be, I didn't think it would be something that would stick. I did it because I had music as an elective. And I'm like, well, fuck, I've got an exam what tomorrow. Do? What do I do? Yeah, yeah I'll tell you I what, and you know, it's <laughs> one of these situations. I'd love to swing back to that in a moment if we could, Braden. But yeah. I know that, again, your parents were a big force inside of your, I guess, your growing up, your early formative years. But mm. were there any other people that you've looked to? Um, for that sources of inspiration and who have helped you become the person you've come become today? Um, I begrudgingly say this because I don't I don't believe in copying anyone. Right. Yep. Um, but I look at people like and I'm not a fan of this particular person in, in real in reality, but I do appreciate what they've done with their career and I find that um, inspiring. Yep. I don't find the person inspiring. Yep. But the individual I'm referring to is RuPaul, who is a drag queen and has RuPaul's Drag Race and stuff on TV. Um, I don't like the person, but I love what he's done with his career. Right. So I, I look at him and go, wow, you know, you've managed to combine your creativity as a drag queen with the marketing and public relations prowess um, with your shows and your talent and your brand. That was really inspiring to see that you could put those two worlds and those particular things together. So I found that inspiring. That, yep. From a music perspective, it's always been people like Grace Jones, Stevie Nicks, like the old school musicians yeah, that yeah. I, my parents were listening to when I was growing up. These are musicians that influenced me because I like that um, Grace Jones is very who she is is who she is. Um, she doesn't change who she is. She's very artistic, outgoing, very eccentric. Oh, absolutely. And that's how, pe that's how people know Grace Jones. Um, and then you have other performers, people like, I don't know, it's a very cliche gay guy talking about Madonna and things like that, but mainly Madonna in a way because she doesn't give a fuck what people think. No. And she's authentically herself. And if you don't like her, there's the door. There's I the door, love yep. I love that mentality and how strong she is with her opinions and things. I don't agree with half the shit that comes out of mouth, but <laughs> I do it. love I do love her passion and her her integrity of who she is as an artist. So I like I draw reference to these sorts of people because I take a little bit of everything and I, I go, okay, well you can be like that and be successful and you can put these things together. Yep. So I kind of watch those sort of people through my career. The other part of it would be people like Richard Branson who just keep readapting and reinventing. Mm -hmm. I find that fascinating as a as a young businessman today now going in a different direction and doing a, a law profession. Yes, yes. Looking at things this way, I, I see that as more of a Richard Branson style approach is, you know, adapt or die yep. approach to business, which is what Richard does. So that would be the people that I would say influence me commercially and as an artist yep um and stevie nicks is very much similar to grace jones in that regard if and, your, she's... and your parents so obviously you had a big uh, part in that as well so yeah now, let, let's talk about your daily routines i know you must be busy given that you're running a leading agency you've achieved so much in a short amount of time what's your day look like are you an early riser um look 
No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I had to think about it. I'm like, recently, yes, but normally, no. Um, I'm, I'm one of those people that likes to get up at 11. I'll wake up when my other half goes to work because they go to work quite early. Yep. Um, they, they're out all day from like, they get up at seven and then they're out until six o'clock in the evening. My workday starts at 11. Beautiful. So I still say goodbye and <laughs> join them for a coffee in the morning, but then I get back into bed and get, get those extra three, four hours. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and they hate it. They absolutely hate the fact, like, oh, I don't know how you do this. It's like, that's because I can smash out a bunch of work in four hours that people would take 10 hours to do. Yeah. Um, and that's just kind of how my brain can compartmentalise things. But I owe that to my mum and my dad in a way because they were very dynamic and reactive to how they did their careers when I was younger. Um, and definitely time management was always a thing growing up. And my parents are very passionate. And my mum was very much on the books and timing yes, and documenting yes. things. And I've taken elements of that. And dad was very routine with what he was doing. So I... I guess they kind of influence how I am today because it's all about keeping the documents and keeping records of everything so you can always back yourself if you need to. Um, and Dad was very much routine regiment with timing because he was a night worker. Yep. So we all kind of revolved our timelines around Dad's working schedule a bit. So um, I think that plays into it a fair bit as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Great feedback. Thank you so much. Now, I, I know I have a bucket list of things I want to do. Um, do you have a bucket list? What's on it? Look, originally my bucket list was to get to Europe, but my other half and I did that last year, and that's a tick. Done. Um, that's, that's done. We went to the Maldives. That was our first romantic holiday together. Fantastic. And uh, not even a year into our relationship, and that's where we went. We did the Maldives, and then um, followed that by Singapore, and then we just did Paris, London, Ireland, um, and then we've got a cruise, which I've never been on, which is another thing was on my list to go on a cruise. I've never done yes. it. So they were doing that next year in March. Um, are you gonna? Other, are you gonna? Are you gonna jump out of a plane or anything crazy? God no! Um, <laughs> I'm scared of heights. You know, I like I like riding in elevators. But we went on this ride at um, Dreamworld, not Dreamworld. What was it? Uh, Disneyland or Universal Studios in Paris? Yep. Um, it was the Tower of Terror ride. Oh, I know and, the one. And like, I love riding in elevators, but that gave me a completely different <laughs> perspective. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Hello. Uh, Oh, now I, I hate heights and I never thought, I never know why I never put heights and lifts together in, the, in my <laughs> head. I was just, as a kid, I used to push the button and ride in the elevators in hotels. And now I'm like, oh yeah, go on that ride. I like rel rides that drop and shit. But the fact that it was following a narrative of an elevator has given me a different... Freaky. <laughs> I'd rather take the stairs, sort of. A, oh, I'm with uh, you. I hear you. <laughs> you but, you know, Europe and that was a bucket list for me. And then the other things were pretty much just starting a business and, and getting that going and meeting someone that I was happy with and my relationship would be great with yeah. and that my parents would be part of that storyline. Yeah. And they are. So I'm really thankful for that because they're things that I thought would I would never find. I have had some very sticky situations with relationships that didn't go how as, I planned. as planned and yep, and yep. they were they were quite toxic and abusive and I came out the other side of those situations and went no nah, no what relationships aren't for me mm -hmm. um but lo and behold I'm lo and behold, here you are. currently in a relationship that's quite good so I, I you know I really appreciate you, you opening up and sharing a little bit about yourself because I think that's what makes the my future business show stick out from the others is that we do take that time to explore the people behind the businesses. But I recall when I was growing up, my first entrepreneurial experience was washing cars. What was yours? Yeah, mine. You know, my first experience, oh, well, there's two. So I went to a marketing school and where I had part of it was to do a start your own business entrepreneur project. And I didn't know much what to do with it. I wanted to make it easy stress-free and which you can't do with any business situation but you know i tried to cut corners i was like oh yeah i'll just resell diaries thinking that that would be easy for an assessment task <laughs> uh, turns out still setting everything up and marketing and everything was still a fucking nightmare so um like that was my first entrepreneurial experience by assessment my other first was definitely starting my marketing business off the back of it so door knocking and going to business and ringing and going, your marketing shit, I'll fix it for free. Let me know what you love. And if you, if you get a result, write me a check. 
I did a lot of that very early because I wanted to be my own boss. Yep. Um, I never wanted to work for anyone. Um, I, I tried my first hotel job as a general manager with one of the five star hotel chains in Australia was as nearly a 12 month stint where I was biting my own tongue off and decided <laughs> I got to get out. Gotta get out of here. Yep. Um, you know, bureaucra you. bureaucracy and uh, unauthentic situations and people that are smiling because they have to. Hypocrisy. I could, I could not, I could not last in an environment like that. I tried to just pretend that it was okay, but I, I couldn't subject myself to it. I love the hospitality sector. A lot of my clients are hospitality businesses, but. I would never put myself back in that, in, in that environment yep. because I know who I am and, and what who I want to be and how I want to project myself and I don't want to limit that. And I found that industry a little bit limiting for me. So, they, there you yeah, go. my career started there, but then marketing, I thought, well, no, I'm good at reading situations and correcting things and I, I do take pleasure in fixing problems for people and solving business issues and marketing and advertising things. So I decided to do my own thing and start my own business. And that was quite challenging because a lot of people were like, well, who the fuck are you? And you say you know all this stuff, but you've what got no portfolio. You you've yeah, got yeah. a piece of paper. You just came out of school. Why the hell will we trust you? I'm like, well, how about I don't charge you? <laughs> and then I'll prove how good I am. And like, I had no idea how good I was at that point. <laughs> I just went, oh, well, you know what? I'm winging I'll it. Oh, you know, if you want, if you like what you get, write me a check. If you yep. hate what I've done, it costs you fucking nothing. You don't nothing. even have to use. No so, fair. and I approached every business that way for the first twelve months, or yeah, I was gonna say six months, but no, for the first year, I did that with fifty businesses. Wow. Um, and then because I had achieved the first five weren't as good. There was one really good one at the start, and I thought, oh yes, I've I've got this, and then I fucked up a few others. Um, yep. but the rest that followed after those first stumbles, cause you have to stumble before you can kind of run in the marketing profession. It doesn't matter how qualified you are, you, you yep. learn by doing. Yep. Um, and so being able to kind of iron out those issues without having a salary at that point, um, and just checks if people wrote them was a really good learning experience to build a business and a brand and a portfolio. So that way I could learn how much to charge and start a successful company. So that's um that was a direct kind of like the apprenticeship isn't it Going yeah a little those bit. school of hard knocks now tell me yeah. uh, i know that you would have gone through some ups and downs how important was your mindset to you at that stage and how did you get through the tough days um getting through the tough days was all i think one thing i learned i've watched a, um this particular presentation done by marie folio who i'd stumbled across early early on when i was first doubling as an entrepreneur yep. <laughs> um, about choosing your friends and making sure people you have in your corner are positive people and positive influences and not people that um, are not adding value, like they're constantly taking or becoming energy vampires on oh, your... Yeah, I know the ones. Right? So I, I found that and I had a lot of people in my life when I was struggling that I thought were there to support me, but I actually found that when I cut those people out, my life got better. Um, Less is more. Less is more, absolutely. And so I took that approach. And at the same time, one thing I also heard learned from Marie was to document it, like journaling. Like when you have a shit day, write about it. Yep. When you have something comes up in your business, write about it. The more you write about it, you get it out of your head. The other side of it was also writing about it and then reflecting on it and going, well, I don't want that to happen again. And if it happens again, flick back and go, well, when did it last happen and why? And being able to compare those things and make positive changes. So for me, a lot of what I was doing to cope with any sort of challenge in my business was writing about it and then also reflecting on it, journaling yeah, and using yeah. music as a distraction, just yeah, that's zoning right. out, whack music on and, um, and you know, you zone yeah. out. <laughs> There's a lot of people who are startup entrepreneurs who have not walked the path that you have thus far and they'll be tuning into this with our ears wide open, as they say. Now, I know that you have... Uh, at least two businesses that I'm aware of. Now, tell us a little bit about those. Sure. So we've got, I've got three. Um, I knew there was so, a number. <laughs> so there's Access Global, which I have positioned as the parent brand for everything, yep. um, even though they're all tied to me in some way. 
Um, Access Global is marketing, advertising and PR for businesses and entrepreneurs internationally. Um, pretty much focused on business growth and strategy and then the rest of it's communications, marketing, advertising, all the elements and bits and pieces you need to have a sustainable, successful business. Um, the other business model is similar. The only difference is the industry it works with. So yeah. Access Global is everything. Hospitality, tourism, real estate, small business, you name it, it does it. The other brand is Sweet Release Agency. That one is only concerned with the adult entertainment industry. Yep. And yes, that's exactly what it sounds like is exactly what it is. Um, yep. It is adult businesses. It's nightclubs, alcohol brands, legalized cannabis, sex toys, dating applications, escort directories, escort big agencies, business, brothels. Business. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you name it, it does it. Essentially, anything you need a photo ID for is what <laughs> Sweet it. Release is. Got it. Um, it's all the high-risk businesses that normally a mainstream business like Axis would not work with because it is a conflict of interest to some of the clients that, you know, may not necessarily be comfy. In those zones, yep. Yeah, and we try and navigate that where we can. <clears throat> the other business is Saray uh, Cabaret, which is <clears throat> music, cabaret, drag, and touring production uh, events. I'm losing yep. my voice because of the hay fever. <laughs> Have a drink if you need one. Have a drink. I will. Give me a second. Absolutely. <clears throat> Much better. All good. All good. <laughs> oh my, my voice is starting to go. Um, no, again. I need that. I need that. <laughs> so that's much better. I should have had one next to me. I'm like, where did I put that? <clears throat> um, Soray Cabaret. So Soray Cabaret is Drag Circus Cabaret production show. Yep. It tours. It partners with dance schools, circus schools, theatre schools. And essentially it's giving a platform for aspiring talent to showcase their talent. That's, That's the short fantastic. Yeah. Look, I, I know that uh, you're a force to be reckoned with in, in these spaces, but uh, before we talk about that in some depth, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about how adversity has actually impacted your life. Because I know that you went from a, a youth minister to an escort to top 100 entrepreneur and mm. top 40 under 40 CEOs. That is one hell of a transformation. <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, yeah. Look, I, like I said, I had a supportive family. <coughs> Um, good old hay fever. Oh, you um, love it this time of year. Oh, it's crazy. Um, but I had a supportive family and they've always been there. They still are. The adversity for me came from identity, um, being, yep. able to, being able to understand my identity, who I wanted to be in the world outside my family was the mm. confronting part. So I thought very early on, I, was, I knew I was different but didn't know where I fit was in the church working as a youth minister and had a bit of an epiphany but also a realisation <clears throat> that I could not lie to myself anymore and help kids come out um, about their sexuality and then lie to myself. So yeah. yep. that issue became very confronting for me. <clears throat> and so I left the church because when I came out, they didn't want anything to do with me at that point. They were like, oh, we can't have a gay youth minister involved with children because, you know, what does that send? What message does that send to parents? And I'm like, well, what assumption are you making of me? Nothing has changed other mm. than my sexuality. I'm not, you know, I'm not a depraved or it's none of their business anyway. Like, I'm not anything that I shouldn't be. Mm. <clears throat> like, kids are kids. Yep. I didn't see them any differently, but the assumption was being made that because I'm gay that I'm going to do something. Um, so that kind of insulted me and made me feel ill. So I thought, well, if you're going to tarnish me that way, just because you don't understand what it means for someone to be gay, like yep. it's not like all the kids that were coming out were going and doing things with other kids. No. Because, like, so it just, it was really confronting and I decided to leave the church but then I was like, okay, well, now where do I belong? Because I honestly thought that if I stayed with the church, I could pray the gay away because it was wrong. I was told yeah. it was wrong. I was told that if I stayed in the church, everything would be fine, you know, you possessed by the devil, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, religion is no longer for me. 
right. it was at a time in my life I thought I needed it. I thought it was going to help. But if anything, it was suppressive. It, it was more judgmental than I thought it would ever be. Because mm-hmm. when, I, when I left religion, when I left church, and I'm not saying that anyone's religion is right or wrong, you believe what you want to believe. Of course. But it's not for me personally. And the only reason I say that is because when I left r- the church and went into the adult industry as a sex worker where I thought, well, and originally it was just when I go to a gay bar in Sydney and meet other gays, but then I met people that were sex workers and nightclub managers and DJs. And so I dabbled, I learnt, I met different people and I became a chameleon a little while Mm -hmm. trying to work out who I was. In that process, I became all those things and tried everything that you could possibly imagine from alcohol (laughs) to other substances Um, and to try and work out what does it mean to be this gay guy? Because before I was just a religious youth minister trying to save people from their sins. Now I'm a gay guy doing what people would consider sins. Um, So I had a polarised view on myself and I had to become comfortable with being the person I am, not the person people wanted me to be. And still family didn't care. They were very open-minded. They still are. Um, they're the same people you see on Australia's Got Talent when they jumped on stage with me and helped me get dressed and all that stuff and cried in the audience and clapped when I got a standing ovation. Their parents are still there today and know everything that happened prior to the show and after. But the interesting thing I found is that I met a lot of different people and because I didn't know where I fit, I landed in situations where I put too much stock in trusting everyone yep. and had and it led to very narcissistic relationships that were very toxic friendships. They were very toxic um, romantic relationships that Mm -hmm. became violent and controlling and I had to navigate those situations. Um, And, you know, on the flip side of that, come to terms with not only my personal identity and what that meant to me, but also not let people encroach or change my view of myself because of me not fitting their narrative. And so through that process, I had a lot of challenges I had to face myself. Very, very early life lessons I had to re- make realizations on to identify myself, my individuality, and my truth, and, and who I was as a person, not what people wanted me to be. And so navigating that was a bit tricky, where I thought, well, I'm creative, I'll do drag. I need to explore my sexuality, I'll be an escort. Um, so I created all these different That's variants. Nice of me it eventually came to a situation where they all started overlapping and that became an issue as well um and i had to make a choice as to whether or not i'd keep some of them or delete some of them because you can't be four people (laughs) (laughs) you can try you can try and when i was young i definitely tried i had friendship circles for one thing and friendship circles for the other and i chameleon interchanged until i put the wrong persona in the wrong group Oh, and goodness. people were like, who the hell are you and why are you? Hang on. Yeah. Now, so... now tell me, I, 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 again, this is one of those we can only just touch the surface yeah. of your life. Now, you have to you have to be writing a book about your life, surely. This, it's such a complex, interesting story. Do you ever have any plans people, to write that book? People keep saying I need to. My friend just wrote a book about her career in the adult industry as the dominatrix. Um, I'm having a little bit of book envy. But it's only because I spoke to her years ago about, oh, people keep saying I should write a book. You know, I went through abusive relationships. I went from church to escort to drag queen and running a business and winning awards. And and I'd like to write a book about it. I said, but I just know my chapter's not, I'm not finished yet. You're because not finished. I know that I've got this other chapter of the law side of things. That is that I believe in my mind and in my heart that, that is, that's the chapter that would close the book on everything else yeah, it just yeah. ties it together it's like he's you know struggle with adversity didn't know where he fit in the world sense of belonging sexuality escort business awards lawyer that's how we got there i think that's, that's volume one. kind of <laughs> kind of you know i just think that that capstones it and puts a finishing point on it because yeah. at the moment i'm still going through that last like last pre chap pre-end chapter yeah, the phase yeah yeah so but she wrote a book and I'm in it for like, a, there's a chapter all about how we met and how I inspired her um, 
in her career as an adult entertainer and how we worked together when we were doing things together under the Sweet Release Agency, running an award show that supported the adult industry. Yeah. And it went really, really well um, up until the point that I needed to get, needed to distance myself from elements of the adult industry um, and COVID hit and that kind of shook every industry but more so the adult industry because of all the maybes and risks around the, yeah, the, the pandemic. So it chewed through a lot of the businesses and a lot of people struggled. So it didn't make sense to run an award show during a pandemic and it certainly didn't make sense to run it after it was over because yeah. the, the industry is in a sense of repair, especially in Australia because it's so tiny um, and incestuous, um, <laughs> there's, not enough, there's not enough people and businesses in the Australian adult industry really to run yeah. an award show that showcases everyone without the same people winning all the time. All the time, yeah, I understand. Um, and I have an issue with award shows that run that way. A little bit of shade here without naming the other programs in Australia. <laughs> but I have an issue with award shows that have a what would be considered a nepotistic um, business scheduled platform. winners just a little bit um, <laughs> and I never wanted to run an award program that way and never did no. but because there was issues in the industry and changes through the pandemic it made sense to slow it down and all of that's kind of covered in in the chapter that um, Jane Untamed writes about in her dominatrix next door book and it was such a privilege to be featured in that because a lot of people have skewed views on me because I'm quite a polarising personality in the different things that I do. But I'm also very shrewd in my approach to yep. my opinions on things and how I feel about things. And people either see that as, oh, he's very rude and abrasive, or they go, he's very passionate and excited and he's very smart and he has calculated thought on things. But yep. most people don't think that way. <laughs> so well, I, people, I know... Yeah. I know that you are unlikely to leave much on the table when all is said and done, and it's, I think it's a credit to you to have Pretty that much. drive. Yeah. Now, tell me a little bit about um, um, one thing. Given mm. that you're involved in so many different things, or at least you were, what is the one thing out of all of these things that you think you excel at, that you are the best at? Fine print. <laughs> I think um, it's one thing that's referenced in a lot of, a lot of uh, write-ups and articles and people's opinions, especially the book that I just read that my friend wrote and it's been published and it's currently going out to the market in a couple of weeks. You can find it in every bookshop. Um, is that I'm good with fine print in contracts. And I would never I, have called that ever. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not a salesperson. I'm very brutally honest, but it's only because I want the best for people because yep. I had to be brutally honest with myself um, and because I am brutally honest and I am my own worst critic I take things very seriously when it impacts me and I just want the very best of things to work and it drives me insane if I can't solve a problem kind even for myself it's the same for clients I will go to the nth degree to find a solution to something providing it doesn't break any laws of but course. I will do anything possible to get the outcome for my client and that's something that I know I'm very good at doing because the client will give up, but I will run different scenarios through my head to get the correct outcome. Um, and the ability to multitask, because I do juggle a lot of different things across different business brands, but being able to compartmentalise is something I've yeah, learned yeah. over the years to not just go, oh, it's so overwhelming, I've got Can't access, sweet release. I've got Saray Cabaret Productions and also a drag queen doing weddings and corporate gigs on the weekends when I'm not doing the business shit. Oh, shit, I've got 50, 60, <laughs> 70, 100,000, you know, 5,000 clients across all these brands. How the yeah, hell yeah. does he have any time to sleep and eat? But it doesn't overwhelm me because I assembled a team to break down all the things that are more administrative. I was going to ask you about your team. Let's talk about yeah. that. So that's kind of how I've navigated the business um, to not be so overwhelming. Yeah, when I started yeah. it, I had 50 clients and I could handle it all myself. As it got bigger, I needed people. So yeah, yeah. I never wanted to rely on anyone to do anything. I thought, you know, go to uni, get the pieces of paper, educate yourself, and then you never need anybody because you know everything. <laughs> and I've kind of done that to a point. I know that with what I specialize in in my career and what my businesses do, 
I'm yep. qualified in every single thing we offer. Recruitment, industrial relations, marketing, advertising, PR, journalism, content, web design. I've done all the pieces of paper. I know I do them well because I've yep. put them all into practice at the beginning of my career when I gave myself out for free and then got checks thrown at me when they were happy. So I know I can do it. Um, yeah. But being able to outsource the things that are time intensive, such as preparing the contract, making those phone calls, organising sales, chasing invoices, um, negotiations. All the admin stuff. The shit that takes the longest to do that's tedious, I don't yep. do anymore. Um, I only get involved in it if I have to. And if it's absolutely necessary that they, then someone needs to get a letter from the CEO, then, I, then I'm involved. But yep. I have people that can manage it well enough for me without me being involved because they know what I would say and so they know how to handle the things the way that I would do it because they know that they need to treat it as if I'm already dealing with it so that way when I do dive in it's no shock to the client because it's going to be the same outcome anyway same outcome. so yeah. I've managed to train my team around that um and I do use a combination of VAs and people that I've trusted overseas with things for quite a while that I've outsourced yep. to. And mm -hmm. that's a good way to scale the business as well. I haven't been putting myself in a position where I've hired all these employees and now I'm stuck with employee tax and super oh, and financial <laughs> shit you don't have to worry about. Um, so I outsource things where I can. But as a family-oriented business, I still compartmentalise the primary services that are being delivered amongst family and amongst yes, our chosen family as well. I say it's a family business, but there are people in my business that aren't blood related yeah. um, that I consider family. And those people are also part of the equation in terms of delivering services under the banner of access and sweet release. So um, it's an assembled family of friends and friends and family that I yeah, call great. my, they call my family. So there you go. And look, that's and kind of how sometimes done. people's whole world is their businesses. And I can see you've struck a balance between private life and professional life. Now I'd like yeah. to ask you as we get to the point of the call, mm. you know, there's a lot to be said about uh, PR and branding, but oftentimes people get confused of the relationship between the two and, and how they're different. Can you mm. tell us a little bit about the importance of PR and branding? People tend to think that PR is a press release. <clears throat> I'll dial it back a little bit. People yep. think that marketing is advertising and people think that advertising is marketing. And then they think that marketing is PR. Um, there is this confusion amongst people that don't know what it all is because if it was all the one thing, you wouldn't have a degree in advertising, marketing, PR. There wouldn't be a piece so of paper. <laughs> there wouldn't be a piece of paper for every single facet if it was all the same because you would just go to uni and do a degree in PR and be a wizard in everything. Are you done? Um, the, the connection between, the, between all of it is that marketing is the strategy. I thought marketing was the fun stuff, um, the creative. <laughs> no, it's about 10%. 90% of marketing is strategy, statistics, planning, curating. It's not the actual creative. Um, right. It can be drafted, but normally people would use an advertiser or an advertising or a graphic designer yep. to put the creative together that's been orchestrated by the marketer because the marketer knows what will work. The advertiser then uses their creative finesse to bring it to life. Now, public relations is telling the story, which is kind of a grey area because yep. there's public relations to write a story as a press release, yes, Press release is part of PR because you're sending it out to the public and public relations is about relating to the public. But in doing so, elements of marketing and elements of advertising come to the forefront because without a story, you don't have a brand. Without marketing and advertising, so without advertising content, you, no one's going to hear about you. Without running a paid ad, no one's going to see it. Um, yeah. so, but all those elements work together as public relations because in order to do all that, it has to be nested under something. So when you go and study PR, what you learn is orchestrating the story and relating to the public, all these different elements of marketing. It's basically like project planning, but, and project management really, but yeah, yeah. with a, with a, with a, like a journalistic lens applied to it, not just, Got okay, it. step one, two, three, four, five, follow a Gantt chart. There's this formula to get shit done. Um, 
it's more about finding stories, finding angles and knowing how to navigate that around the marketing and the advertising being created. Um, the clients do seem to find it confusing and people find it confusing. Oh, yeah. Because oh, it's, and you can and you can see why, can't you? And that's really yeah. I guess your charge is to take away that confusion. Now tell me, what does it yeah. make you feel like, Braden, when when you successfully deliver outcomes for your clients? Do you still get a bit of a buzz out of it? Always. I think I'll get a buzz the same way I'll get when I went my first court case. Um, <laughs> as a lawyer, I, I am one of those people that loves to win. I think if you don't have the motivation to win, you won't be good at anything that you do. Um, because when people's opinions encroach on what you think you can achieve and you take that on board too much, people's opinions and thoughts and reflections or projections of their own insecurities onto you, you start to wear yourself down. And I've been there when I used to listen to all of that and it just ate away at me. Um, winning things or being in a position where you create something and someone achieves a win from the work that you do, if you pat yourself on the back for that or if they appreciate that back, that gives me a buzz. And if I see that I know that they've done something that cost them a lot of money and then I step in and it saves them a lot of money and they get a better result, then... Oh, yeah. You know, of course, I'm going to get a buzz off that That's because I know moment. because I know that I can screenshot that. And the first thing I want to do is screenshot it and then email it and go, look at what I just did. Social proof. Um, there it is. Yeah. So it's um, I still get a buzz out of it, but I know that I'll I'm I'm very eager to win the first case in court still, um, yeah. even though I'm not finished. I'm not finished a law oh, thing. You will but, be. You will but be. But I'll be good at it. I think I had this same conversation with another another podcast recently where I said I think because I'm very good at talking. Um, the lawyer, the magistrate would probably just go, oh, for God's sake, Brady. <laughs> case dismissed. Case, dis case dismissed. <laughs> I'm loving this call, Brady. Thank you so very much. You know, um, there's lots of people who will be on this call of, uh, already looking at your businesses now. Um, as we're at the pointy end of the call, I'm just wondering mm. if you could share with us if people, in regardless of what business it is, um, one, how are they going to find you and what's the onboarding uh, process when they do? Yeah, perfect. People, if you want to find me and connect with me away from all of the business bits and you just want yep. to have a chat to me one-on-one, -on -one, you can go to bradenreese.com. Um, the spelling's a bit weird, so maybe Rick will pop it somewhere and you Absolutely. can find it. Yep. Um, otherwise, you can go to accessglobal.co. Um, you'll be able to jump on there. The onboarding process is the same, doesn't matter where you go. Um, yep. Access Global Co. is every business except the adult industry stuff. Um, if you go to the Access Global Co. website and go to our brands, you'll find Sweet Release and you can go from there to Sweet Release. Um, oh. And then Sweet Release Agency is for adult industry marketing, PR and, and everything that Access doesn't do. Um, Sweet Release is over there. Is over there. Um, yep. So, but across the brands entirely, it's generally a 20-minute consultation call. So I want to get to know you. You're obviously going to want to get to know me because when I do these calls with new clients, it is me that you talk to um, because I like to get to know who I'm working with. And then from that 20-minute call, we'll dive into your business, your goals, your aspirations, what you hate, what you don't hate, what you love, what you wish would happen, what's the silver bullet for your business, what would make you happy in three, six months. Getting enough of that information is really handy because I know what I'm working with and I know what we're working towards. Um, and then sometimes you need to fill out a couple of other surveys. It's not just a 20-minute phone date. Sometimes it does end up being that I need a bit more information. And yep. so I'll send a summary of the call, a couple of links to some surveys. Sometimes it's about PR, digital ads uh, or marketing just to get some more insight from your perspective. Yep. Because I want to know what's in your head and what you think and feel so I can understand where you're coming from as a client. And then when I read all through that information, I then get a proposal together which you get sent. And then we jump on another call and go through it. But when you get sent the proposal, it's like a 30, 40 page document with all the prices, all the information, everything tailored to your goals everything because I've read need. through everything. And it's up to you if you work with us. All the fine print's in there too. And if you want to sign it and choose a package or choose a service, you just choose a drop down, click it, sign it, send it, and we go. We start. Go so it's, it's a fairly streamlined process. I'd say probably seven out of 10 clients make it to that point. Um, 
there's always the three in ten that have unrealistic expectations and want to spend a dollar to make a million and no, don't yeah. and don't understand that to make money you got to spend money and i do my damnedest to keep our prices down so that way your investment goes where it needs to go yep. but um ultimately it comes down to having realistic expectations and and not you know expecting the world and, and something not, for nothing yeah which unfortunately there are businesses out there and if you're expecting a free handout from me i am not the guy not the guy for you um had you have met me when i first started i would have said just write me a check <laughs> if you're happy but um i've learned not anymore i've learned not to do that anymore um and so yeah essentially they're the, they're the onboarding tools but in yep. brief access global is everything marketing advertising pr business growth and consultancy every industry worldwide and sweet release is every adult business entertainment porn star escort that wants to get out of the industry or navigate the industry or build a brand and make it profitable come it's and there. see us over there um absolutely at both businesses you'll either talk to me as Braden or you'll meet me as jet um yeah. so, <laughs> So, yeah, feel free to Google search that. Um, but, um, yeah, essentially that's how you can get in touch with those. Serate Cabaret Productions being the third business, it's very rare that I engage anyone that just wants to be a talent in a show because I do yeah. have relationships now with dance schools, music schools and um, theatre schools where I am loyal to the students that go There's to those. There's a path there, isn't there? So. Yeah. I, I value that because the people that own those schools are the performers that were in my first show. And yep. so I want to give back to them by having them involved. So if you're trying mm -hmm. to get involved in that, you probably have to go and be part of it. Go, go down, <laughs> follow the path. Now, Braden, yeah. um, again, I'll be making sure that uh, everybody who's seen this call will be getting access to, there you go, access to accessglobal.co. <laughs> <laughs> that it. rhymes. Almost love it. Now, well, look, if you're on this call, you've heard uh, what we've spoken about today. We've only really just touched the surface. I would very much recommend that you go visit um, accessglobal.co. Check out all of the work that Braden's uh, doing. There'll be links below this um this post, no matter where you see, you're definitely going to be able to find the links back to Braden, all of his wonderful work. Braden, I have to say, great call. Thank you so much for joining me on the My Future. Thanks for having me. Today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for putting up with the sinus infection. <laughs> <laughs>